Allah is so powerful, he doesn't have to become visible in how he exerts his power. لَطِيفٌ لِمَا يَشَاء He's subtle in how he does things. Delicate in how he is, does things. Nearly unnoticed in how he does things. You know? And some things is very obvious, and some things is very delicate and invisible. And that's actually one of the great manifestations of the might of Allah Azza wa Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd fa a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yusabbihu lillahi ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard al-maliki al-quddus al-aziz al-hakim. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqtatan bil lisani yafqahu qawli. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. Once again everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. We're going to start talking about the name al-malik of Allah. So Allah has uniquely described himself in this surah or in the opening ayah with four names, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. Many places in the Quran, Allah mentions two of his names together, like Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim, Ghafoor, Al-Rahim, things like that, right? So this surah is unique because the opening has four names together. So that is a special uh, uh, feature of this surah. So the first of those names is Al-Malik. It's used rarely in the Quran. It's not as common as you might think. But let's talk about a little bit of where the word malik comes from. So the word malak, or the verb malaka, actually has to do with making something hard. Like you know when you make the dough and the the the, the bread, and the dough becomes tougher, that's actually tamlik of the of the bread. Uh, from it also comes the idea of uh, the milak of something is the foundation of a building, uh, or something that you build on top of. Malakut tariq is the middle of the road, meaning the most firm part of the road. Qawaimu kulli dabbatin mulukuhu, the feet of an animal that it's, it stands firm on. They're also called the muluk of it, meaning all of it has to do with firmness, toughness, stability, that sort of thing. These are the meanings in it. Uh, when you have control over something, that's called malaka an uh, or you know, command over something is a malaka. Malaka nafsahu, to, to, to have control over yourself is mulkun nafs. If you're able to control your emotions or if you're able to control your behavior. So these are, the, the, the word keeps having to do with kingdom or actually control and power and stability. These are the recurring themes inside of the word uh, mulk. Then comes the idea of when you hold something firm in your hand, that you have mulk over it. So it's something firmly, you're grasping something firmly. So, um, it's actually interestingly also used when a man is very possessive over his wife. Then they actually say malak al mar'a. It doesn't mean he owned the woman. It actually means he's very possessive over her, like very dominating or controlling over her, etc. Now, how is this used for Allah in the Quran? First of all, in the Fatiha, we have two readings: Maliki Yomiddin and Maliki Yomiddin, right? So, and Malik and Malik are two different words. So, let me help you understand them in easy language. Malik means owner. So I'm the malik of this laptop, the malik of this laptop, but I'm definitely not the malik of this laptop. That would be a little bit dramatic of me because I am the owner of this laptop, but I'm definitely not the sovereign king ruler of this laptop. Okay, so you can own a car, you can own a pen, you can own a shirt, but you can't declare yourself the sovereign king of your t-shirt. It doesn't make sense. So the, the idea of kingdom is vast. The, the word malik is used for vast territory. That you could be the king of an island. You could be the king of a country, king of an empire, etc. Right? Uh, in America, we use the king very loosely. This, this, this is the king of pizza. And this is the king of, you know, tires. And the tire can Come to the tire king for your special discount, etc. So they use these words king loosely. But the idea of kingdom is actually a vast empire of, of some sense. Interestingly... A phrase in the Quran combines both of these concepts. Malik al-Mulk. Qul illahumma Malik al-Mulk. Right? Which is two different concepts. It actually means the owner of kingdom. So the, the word for ownership is milk. Milk. So it would be Malik al-Mulk. Or Malik al-Mulk. So one would be the owner of ownership or the king of kingdom. But Allah fused the two phrases together. He said, Malik al-Mulk, which means the owner of kingdom. So let's understand the difference between owner and king a little bit deeper. When I own something, like if I own this machine, 
that I'm engaged with it, I'm taking care of it, I have more direct access to it. But if I'm the king of a nation, do I have control over everyone living under my nation? No, because or well, generally I have authority, but I don't have direct reach to everything that's under my kingdom. I have to have advisors, governors who have to have their own soldiers or their, their departments, and those departments have lieutenants and so on and so forth, right? Until you get to, for example, the, the a government is at the top, you have the president or something, right? In the old days, you have a king. And at the bottom, you have somebody working at the post office. But the post office worker works for a department, which answers to a department, which answers to a department, and eventually goes up all the way to the ultimate authority, you understand? But in that little department, he acts like he's the king, the post office guy, right? And he's like, but the idea is that he's the 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 the, the malik doesn't do direct engagement, but the malik does. The malik does direct engagement. Allah takes both of those names and fuses them together when He says Malik al Mulk. Another name of Allah is Malik in the Quran. Fi maqadi sidqin inda Malikin muqtadir. Malik means the one who will always stay the king. It's his sifa. So the one who will remain king forever. Because kingdoms, what's what comes in your mind when you come when you think of kingdom? Somebody inherited the kingdom, or somebody usurped or took kingdom by force. That's how you get kingdom. And eventually that king, whoever took it, is going to get old. And he's going to either have a brother or a son or a younger son versus an older son. Some drama is gonna happen, right? And kingdom is going to get passed on. The king cannot hold on to the kingdom forever. Allah's name is also Malik, which means the forever king. The forever king. That's one of Allah's names, okay? Then, uh, the, the the interesting thing about the word Malik when it comes on its own, Al-Malik, it's both times associated with, two times associated with Al-Quddus, the next name that's coming. Al-Malik Al-Quddus is here. Al-Malik Al-Quddus will also come in Surah Al-Hashr. Okay, so... Al-Malik Al-Quddus Al-Salam Al-Mu'min Al-Muhaymin, right there. And of course, there's also the phrase, فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ Which means how high Allah is, the ultimately deserving king. The king who is the king who deserves to be the king. Also because when you think of kingship, you always you sometimes think of a person who doesn't deserve it. Right? They don't des truly deserve to be the king. They're the useless prince that became the king. Or these people, they took over power and they unjustifiably took over the kingdom and therefore they became the king. But they're not the rightful king. You know, so many movies you haven't seen because you're Islamic are about fights against the unrightful, unjustified king and the rightful king comes and wants to claim his, you know, make his claim on the throne and there's a whatever drama happens, right? So the idea of al-malik al-haq is the rightful king. And Allah mentions over and over again in the Quran, Lahul Mulk. He owns all kingdom. He owns all kingdom. It's a very interesting concept. Allah Himself is the king, but then He says He owns all kingdom. What's the difference between these two? One is about Allah Himself. He's the king. The other is every king that ever existed is actually owned by Allah. He owns all kingdom. Like He owns, He He decides when they live and when they die. Here they are thinking they decide when someone lives and someone dies. But actually Allah is deciding whether they live and whether they die. Which is why Allah says, لَهُ الْمُلْكُ وَلَهُ الْحَمْدُ يُحْيِي وَيُمِيدُ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ You know, like in, in uh, Surah Al-Hadid, لَهُ الْمُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يُحْيِي وَيُمِيدُ He owns the kingdom of the skies and the earth, he gives life and he gives death. Uh, you're distracting them. They're, they're looking at you. They're, they're, there's so many people looked at you right now, it's like, I wanted to look at you. This, that's what happens. Huh. I keep I keep an eye on you people. Okay, anyway. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. See, I have no problem with awkward moments. I have this. It's okay. It's okay. It happens. There was one time I was giving a khutbah. This guy got a phone call. First row. Okay, if you're going to pick up your phone, at least be in the back row. He's in the first row. And you know, some people, when they get a call, long distance call, they think it's still 1975 where they have to talk extra loud because you're going across the ocean. It's a WhatsApp call, dude. Everybody gets the same message. Like, it's not a different... Hello, is everything okay? Yeah. How's uncle? Uncle's good. Yeah, over, over and out. It's not a walkie-talkie, man. So I go to the The guy starts doing this and I was like, in the middle of the I was like, 
I just stopped my khutbah. I was like, this is a really interesting conversation. Let me just finish. So he took a full 90 seconds, finished his conversation. I was like, is uncle okay? He goes, yeah, he's okay. I was like, okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so Al-Malik actually has to do with rule, ownership, and control. Let's talk about these three concepts. Rule, ownership, and control. Is it possible that you can have rule without ownership? For example, the government you live under has rule. But does it have ownership of your property? It doesn't, right? So there's some level of your own ownership, even though somebody else has the rule. You have Oh, and the flip can happen. You can have ownership, but you don't have what? Rule. You have ownership over your car, but you don't have the rule over it to drive however you want. Okay? Uh, you, can, you, can't even, you can have ownership over your house, but there are rules in your neighborhood and you cannot modify it however you want. You cannot make whatever changes you want. There are regulations in place. You have ownership, but you don't have rule. So those two things can exist separately. You can also have rule without control. The government in a country can have rule, but does crime still happen? Yeah, so they have rule, but they don't have control. Okay, Forget crime, even in a government, the, the, you know, there's a president, there's a vice president, there's a chancellor, there's whatever other roles. Does the president, the higher level authority, does he necessarily control the behaviors of everybody in his own office? No, no. In fact, forget government, even in a business. If many of you run a business, you are the owner of the business, so you have the rule, and your own employees are not under your control. Like the moment you look away, things are happening. And even when you're looking, they're looking straight at you and doing the wrong thing. You're like, why did I hire you? You know? So so anyway, so you can have ownership, you can have rule without control. You can also have ownership without control. A man can own a horse, for example, and the horse is not under his control. Right? Is that it's not under your control? And it, in fact, one of the most interesting examples of ownership, supposed ownership, is our body, right? If you, if you think of one thing that you have complete autonomy over, it's your own body. But I don't have control over, you know, things like my cholesterol or, you know, my my heart rate or you know, I can't control those things the way that I would like to. I cannot control aging the way I would like to. It's not under my control. You know, my if your if your eyesight is getting weaker, you can't control that. You know, you can't control your allergies. So we don't even actually have we have some level of ownership over our bodies, but we actually don't really have control. So there when Allah describes himself as ultimately Al Malik, he's taking all three things at once. He's taking rule, he's taking ownership, and he's taking control, which in the real sense nobody else can have. You can't have all three yourself. It's impossible. And that's why he's Al-Malik, the ultimate. He's not just a king, he's the ultimate king. Now, the other interesting thing in another ayah in Ali Imran, Allah did something really remarkable when it comes to kingdom or ownership. Allah separated it from dignity. He says, He separated those two concepts. In other words, Allah says, you, we tell Allah, we ask, we declare to Allah, you give kingdom to whoever you want. And you take it away from whoever you want. And you honor whoever you want. And you humiliate whoever you want. You know what that means? Sometimes Allah will take kingdom away from someone, but they still have honor. Sometimes Allah will give kingdom to someone, but they have humiliation. Separate concepts. In this world, we think whoever has kingdom has honor. And whoever has no kingdom has been humiliated. But Allah says, no, those are that's a separate thing that He gives and takes away. And honor and humiliation are separate things that He gives and takes away. So for example, Ibrahim salam has no kingdom, but he's honored. And Namrud has a lot of kingdom, but he's humiliated. You understand? Fir'aun has a lot of kingdom, but he's humiliated. And Musa salam has no kingdom, but he's He's honored. So he can give and take as he wants. And then he can give both to someone. He can give honor and kingdom. Like Dawud alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam. He can give both to them. Or he can take both away from them. Like Ayyub alayhi salam. Or, you know, he, he can be humiliated by his family and even tested in that way. Or Yusuf alayhi salam. He's being humiliated by people being falsely accused to be thrown in jail. And then he can give both back to him. 
He could give the he give his reputation back. He give kingdom to him, authority to him. Both of those came back to him. So this is up to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And when we think of Allah as Al Malik, some of these things have to be kept in mind. But I want to dig into Malik Al Malik some more, more than even some of the other names. So when you think of the concept of kingdom, what are some thoughts that come in your mind? First of all, is its vastness. You know, if a kingdom is only a kingdom that's one square kilometer. It's not really a kingdom. But how how large is the empire? How big is the kingdom? Like the you know the the the, the British Empire, for example, at some time, you know, or the the Spaniards when they expanded at some point, right? The Roman Empire before them, the Egyptians, the Great Egyptian Empire. You think of their vastness, like even Allah mentions this vast concept of vastness of kingdom when the Pharaoh spoke in the Quran. Pharaoh says, "Alay sali mulku misra." Do I not alone own the kingdom of Egypt? Don't these rivers flow under my feet? So what's he referring to? The vastness of the kingdom. Now, we're doing tasbih of Allah with the word king. So when we think of Allah's kingdom, one thing we should think about is the vastness of Allah's kingdom. The size, the expanse of Allah's kingdom. You know, when you when I walk into when I fly into Germany, I have to show my passport to be able to enter this kingdom. Give it whatever name, governance, sovereign nation, right? But I have to I have to and I have to now observe the laws that apply here, the driving rules that apply here. If I go to uh, England where everything is wrong, then I have to drive on the wrong side and the, the car, you know, everything's wrong. But I have to do that because that's what's right there. Okay? So the idea is when you walk in, you are under the rule, the territorial rule of that king. And, and then there are signs, right? Like there are, you know, the, the manifestations of its might, police, military, the monuments, the castles, the, the, the military arsenal. So Allah Azza wa Jal says that people that like to show off their power, like the like Americans like to show off their power with, you know, the flag and the eagle and a machine gun or whatever. That's their that's their thing. That's their symbols of power, right? Military might, right? A militant nation. Well, you know, Allah describes Namrud, for example, who like to show off his power, right? Allah Tara in the Haja Ibrahima fi Rabbihi and Natahullah Mulk. Didn't you see the one who debated against Ibrahim alayhi salam only because Allah had given him kingdom? He wants to show off how powerful he is. He's going to kill someone, whoever he wants. He's going to let somebody live, right? A demonstration of, of his might. By the way, interestingly, the most powerful, sustained, powerful nations don't like to show off their might. The nations that are truly powerful, they don't have to show it. People recognize it anyway, but they don't have to do it. You know, the nations that are unstable politically, you know what they have to do? They have to keep reminding their people who's in charge. So they have to keep putting a picture of their king or the ruler in every place. So, hey, don't forget, that's, that's your king. Okay, before you go to the bathroom, just hey, hi to the king and then go to the bathroom. You know, so they have to do that because there's no recognition of that power. It has to be forced on the people. But when a kingdom is stable, when a kingdom is stable, you don't have to have flags in your face all the time. You don't have to have the reminder of who the king or the authority is. You don't have to do that because it's already the manifestation of its power is actually how smooth the kingdom is running. Almost as though government in political science, the government that is the most invisible is the most powerful. You know that? And the government that's the most visible, meaning you have to bring the armies out and the tanks out on the street and you have to have soldiers going down the street. That shows you how weak that government has become because they cannot control their nation. You understand? If you think about it from those perspectives, on the one hand, Allah's kingdom is very obvious. The entire universe is Allah's kingdom. But Allah not enforcing His rule in the most visible way, you know, al-zahir wal batin, which was taught to us in Surah Al-Hadid, is actually one of the ways you can think about the manifestation of Allah's power. Allah is so powerful, He doesn't have to become visible in how He exerts His power. لِطِيفٌ لِمَا يَشَاء He's subtle in how He does things. Delicate in how He does things. Nearly unnoticed in how He does things. You know? And some things is very obvious, and some things is very delicate and invisible, and that's actually one of the great manifestations of the might of Allah Azza wa Here's what's coming up in the next episode and this deeper look of Surah Al-Jumu'ah. What does Allah say is an ayah in the Quran? History is an ayah. 
The mountain is an ayah. The sky is an ayah. The animal is an ayah. My body is an ayah. What's going on inside my chest is an ayah. All lived experience is a set of what? Ayat. And each one of them becomes valuable. Because they are ayat of the king. So there are two kinds of ayat in the Quran. There are ayat all around us. And there are ayat of his revelation. But they both go, they are valuable because they are ayat of the king. Just like the, the king of the, the, the cup of the king in, in the, the surah.